a very good afternoon uh, to all participants. Uh, this is a um, joint webinar organized by the SIMC with uh, LES Singapore, LES India, and uh, CCPIT. Uh, my name is Lionel Tan. Uh, I'm the current president of LES Singapore. And uh, uh, before I make the introductions to uh, this, um, all my esteemed uh, panelists, uh, I think we will start with a short poll just to under get an understanding of you know the participants' uh, um, uh, familiarity with some of the uh, mediation uh, issues. Uh, so with that, Angelica, um, can I ask you to uh, start the poll? Okay, um, I believe the poll is on. Yep, uh, if, if those, if you're not seeing the poll, just go on to the below the poll button and click on it and then you'll come up as well. Yeah, I, don't, I think it's, uh, so the poll will ask you, have you been involved in any kind of mediation? And it's a multiple choice. You click yes, it's a party. Yes, it's a mediator. A yes, it's a counsel. Or yes, it's a case administrator. Yes, an observer assistant and or, or no. Okay, we just want to just uh, appreciate if you could just uh, you know look through this and and click on it so we have an understanding of uh you know what, what is your particip participation level in of for mediation. And uh, just um, in the course of this uh, event, uh, the speakers will be presenting their their um um presentation slides. If you somehow need to see the faces of the uh, speakers, uh, you can just adjust also the, on the screen. You can push, uh, you can uh, adjust to the screen and ensure that the speakers' uh, uh, visuals are at the side of your screen. So that's possible, okay? And in a, uh, this, this session is recorded. Um, and also the, the speakers will be making their slides available. Uh, to all to 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 the participants. Okay, so so um, just rest assured that uh, you can be you the slides will be made available, and um, we as we go through the sessions, I'll introduce speakers and then they will go through their sessions. Um, at the end, we do have a Q and A session. Uh, but in the course of when you hear listening to the speakers, um, if you have any um, questions, uh, please do uh, um uh, type it into the Q and A uh, section button. Right, click on there and then please post your question. Okay, uh, I'll be looking through the questions and uh, you know if there's any duplications and then we'll we will go through the questions and then with that we will post it right at the end uh, to the various speakers. Okay. Okay, I think uh, with that, um, let me now introduce uh, the esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, before that, uh, just a quick introduction. So this um, this webinar joint webinar is uh, together. Uh, uh, by LES Singapore and LES India with SIMC as well as CCPIT. Just a brief introduction for those who are, who are not familiar with LES. Uh, LES is actually the Licensing Executive Society uh, International, so that's LESI. Uh, it's a global association uh, established in 1973, and we have 33 national and regional uh, member uh, societies uh, out of 90 countries um, and serving 6,500 individuals. Uh, and uh, it's a non-profit organization. Um, so the main business is to advance the business of IP. And um, it's, we are in the business of create, uh, you know, creating, protecting, and commercialization of innovations and managing and pro uh, monetizing IP. So uh, our members are made up of licensing professionals, IP managers, IP lawyers, uh, international, uh, intellectual assets uh, valuations, um, and you know, um, anyone uh, also tech transfer officers from uh, various universities. Uh. So our purpose is to um, you know uh, increase this knowledge of IP protection and uh, licensing issues. Uh. So uh, LES Singapore, LES India, for example, we are the the national societies forming part of LESI. So if you are in any jurisdictions, um, please do. Uh, if you've not already joined, please do find out about your national jurisdictions and then please apply to join. Uh, the, the your your national jurisdiction. More information about LESI can be found at les.org, the website. And then right at the, the, the front page of the LESI website, 
you will find right at the bottom all the national societies. So, so please click on to the national society in which you are uh, involved in, and then uh, please find out from your national societies as well. Okay, now with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists uh, for this webinar. Uh, first, we will have uh, Lashika Joshi. Uh, Lashika is uh, IP uh, lead for Cap Gemini Engineering and Global uh, Legal Lead for the for Cap Gemini Software Frameworks and Solutions. And uh, as, as we all know, Cap Gemini is a multinational IT uh, service and consulting company, right? Um, and, and based in Paris and France. In France, I think overall worldwide they have over over hundred thousand uh, uh, employees. So I think Lashika has a quite a busy role, uh, you know, managing that. And apart from that, Lashika is also the honorary secretary of LES uh, India, and uh, also a VP of the High Tech Society of LESI, and co-chair of the Industry Advisory Board for IT and Software for LESI. So she's a very uh, involved member of LES, and uh, we're very happy to have her today to share on the aspects of uh, India um, ADR, uh, especially on the new uh, the Mediation Act in India. Okay. Uh, following from uh, Lashika, then uh, we will have uh, Lao Juni. Uh, Juni is the Deputy CEO of uh, Singapore International Mediation Centre. And as you understand, her job uh, and her main focus is developing international uh, commercial mediation services. And especially, I think, uh, putting Singapore as a forefront. And I think uh, in, in the course of her presentation, she will be talking about how, um, you know, how IP how mediation forms a very big part of perhaps uh, resolving disputes um, and also talking about enforcement issues and of course, uh, talking about the Singapore Convention. So welcome Juni uh, to, to this uh, panel. And I think you will hear a lot of insights from, from her. Uh, being a fellow Singaporean, okay. Uh, so we are all flying our Singapore flag. So uh, we'll look forward to uh, hearing from Juni. And then uh, we will have Mr. Fu Beiji. Uh, Mr. Fu Beiji is the Deputy Director of Legal Affairs Department of uh, China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, uh, CCPIT, uh, the Hangzhou Committee, right? So uh, very, again, very happy to have uh, Mr. Fu, very honored to have him. So he'll be sharing on the aspects of ADR and dispute resolution and especially mediation uh, in, in China. I think we're all very interested to understand that. And of course, uh, then also talking about the new cloud platform uh, which they are promoting. So I think what we've tried to assemble for this webinar is a cross selection of um, mediation services, mediation approach from various jurisdictions. So you're hearing from India, you're hearing from Singapore, you're hearing from China. Um, to some extent, a mediation all is all about resolution of disputes. And so to ensure that, you know, rather than going for full disputes, uh, the matter can be settled hopefully amicably, and hopefully it's a win-win situation for all parties, uh, right? But getting there, getting there um, will have understanding of the uh, sports, the cultural nuances of the businesses, the commercial realization and commercial interest of the, of the, of the businesses, as well as the process, the procedures that, are, that will avail yourself if you have any disputes, let's say in India, in Singapore or China. Uh, I think uh, today's webinar, we hope to shed some light on that aspects and um you know uh, we welcome uh, questions from the floor uh, or your you you have a very esteemed uh, panelists here uh, who are uh, experts in in their particular field and in their particular jurisdictions okay now thank you uh, with that uh, I'd like to hand over uh, to uh, Lashika to start off uh, with the presentation on and on mediation aspects of IP in India Lashika over to you please Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Elias Singapore. And uh, thanks to all my co-panelists. Um, without much ado, I'll start with the presentation and I'll try to keep it crisp because um, uh, we have a question session later on that follows and uh, probably we'll take questions and address most of the queries at that point. Uh, just let me know, Lionel, if you're able to see my screen. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, this is ADR dispute session, and I thought I'll start with uh, uh, a specific problem of ADR and IP disputes, and uh, at least with an India perspective, I would like to highlight why we focus on ADR quite a bit and why some of the mechanisms for ADR are uh, the way they are. Well, before that, I wanted to just uh, share this slide and 
share this image with all of you. I'm sure you're wondering uh, what this is about. Well, you will see uh, uh, the, the red box, uh, War, What Is It Good For? It is a book that I came across a couple of years back. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, what it talks about is, uh, well, this is a Stanford classics professor, Anne Morris, who talks about how war is not always bad. You know, conflicts have given us a lot of things that we don't realize. In fighting wars, people have created larger, more organized societies that reduce the risk that their members will die violently and things like those. And in fact, if you look at history of intellectual property, some of the very, very uh, commonly available things, uh, including, well, um, the, the World Wide Web, have been developed uh, as um, as a byproduct of uh, you know uh, research that was done by either uh, uh, war related organizations or organizations that are responsible for defense and research and hence there are many many uh, you know innovation and intellectual property that you come across that are given to us including tinned uh, food and cans uh, that tin it, you know, uh, due to world wars. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but just wanted to bring to fore that conflicts are not always bad. Uh, well, especially for lawyers, you know, we thrive on those. Anyhow, uh, so moving from there, uh, you know, uh, I would like to then highlight what uh, and how ADR is good, how we can achieve ADR. So understanding what ADR is, why it's important and how is the key of my presentation. Here are some of the forms of ADR we commonly see. <clears throat> and uh, all of these lead to uh, settlements and resolutions that are outside court without litigation uh, in mutually agreeable manner. Parties come to resolving issues that uh, a, a, you know aid in business and that aid in technology developments also. Uh, because we're talking uh, from an LES perspective, LES is a society that manages uh, IP licensing issues, whether it is promotion, education, or furthering the cause of IP licensing. I think it's extremely important here that we look at what are some of these alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. These are some, on the slide, you'll see some very tangible benefits of it. I'm sure other co-panelists are also going to touch upon it. Uh, many of us already understand these uh, tangible benefits, and therefore we are here to, uh, you know, join this session. As um, multinational companies do business across the globe in multiple jurisdictions where laws differ because IP laws are specifically territorial in nature, it is important that we adopt mechanisms that allow us to settle and resolve conflicts outside court because sometimes court proceedings can get unpredictable, especially in um, territories where <clears throat> these are very complicated. There are a lot of procedural uh, hiccups and things like those. So uh, that is why ADR is something <coughs> that is extremely important for <clears throat> IP professionals such as us that are doing the business of intellectual property licensing. Now, within ADR, as I mentioned before, there are multiple mechanisms that uh, are <clears throat> available. At times, parties find it a little difficult to choose the appropriate forum because, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bad throat, uh, difficult to choose the forum, whether it should be mediation or conciliation or arbitration. And therefore, <clears throat> each with its own nuances, with its own goods and bads, needs to be weighed very carefully and seen in light of what the business goal, what the business objective is. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, <coughs> we've always had a very, um, uh, a, a, a conundrum when it came to arbitrability of intellectual property disputes in India. Uh, and uh, these are some of the landmark judgments that we've had in India, where <coughs> the courts looked at very carefully whether or not IP disputes specifically can be actually arbitrated upon. And um, there, there was a landmark judgment of <coughs> uh, Booz Allen case, where a test was laid down by the Supreme Court of India, which said that, we, you know, when uh, a conflict comes uh, to the fore, I think the test lies in seeing whether it is a conflict or a dispute in REM versus if it is a dispute or action in personum. 
if it is a dispute in REM, which means that it impacts <clears throat> uh, more than the concerned, more than uh, just the uh, plaintiff, then and it is uh, uh, it is in accordance with or uh, you know it is uh, <clears throat> contrary to the public policy of the country it cannot be arbitrated upon but if it is an action in personam uh, for example if it is a licensing matter if it is a licensing dispute or it is a dispute relating to other <clears throat> actions which only impact the parties involved then it can be surely arbitrated upon now with IPR, we are in a unique situation because intellectual property rights have <clears throat> a lot of ancillary and related rights that come along with it. So uh, something like patentability, which can impact uh, not just the inventor, but the person, uh, you know, public at large is something that cannot be arbitrated upon because that is decided by the authorities, that is decided by the government, the government will actually confer the certificate <clears throat> of patent and therefore that is something that two parties cannot uh, just simply decide through arbitration in a contract or a clause of arbitration in a contract. Uh, disputes which relate to criminal offenses, guardianship and so on also cannot be arbitrated upon. However, if it is <clears throat> a dispute which is very specific to ancillary rights that are coming out or stemming out of the IP rights that are uh, granted to the inventor, those can be arbitrated upon. If these are uh, rights that arise from an agreement, they can be arbitrated upon. They, this is a breach of a certain obligation, warranties, uh, infringement against a certain party, all of these can be arbitrated upon. So, uh, you, you know, in, in short, we've had mixed rulings, but I think those mixed rulings can very easily be categorized into these two areas in REM and in personum. <clears throat> and uh, the ones that can actually be arbitrated upon, um, uh, you know, are also covered by the Commercial Courts Act because oh, Rather, all the IP disputes are now covered by Commercial Courts Act of 2015 in India because these are now categorized as specific commercial disputes. So, um, uh, you know, I, I needed to mention the arbitration aspect because we've had mixed rulings, we've had <clears throat> mixed decisions and a lot of confusion uh, in people's mind regarding arbitrability of IP disputes in India. But now we are moving a step further. We are moving from not just arbitration, which was the uh, only predominant alternative dispute resolution mechanism to also mediation in India, which has now been enacted. The Mediation Bill of 2023 was passed <clears throat> by Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha on August 1 and August 7. And then subsequently it received, it received the presidential assent on September 14, and it's now formally an act in India. It is an act to uh, promote and facilitate mediation as a formalized mechanism for alternate dispute resolution or rather appropriate dispute resolution in India. Well, in India as a culture, we've always had uh, a lot of mediation at a panchayat level, you know, by uh, local village levels. We used to have um, we, we used to have these groups of elder men who would uh, uh, mediate upon disputes between two parties. So we've always culturally for ages had this culture, but it was not formalized into an act or a structure has now been given to it. Now, <clears throat> this act actually applies to all mediation proceedings that are conducted in India, um, or if, uh, you know, if all or both of the parties uh, reside in the country, uh, or if, one of them have a place of business or have been incorporated in India. And uh, for, for the act to be applicable, uh, the, you know, the, there is not a necessity that the parties have to have a mediation agreement. It could even be a, a simple clause in the uh, agreement between the two parties. Uh, just in case there is not even a clause in the agreement between the parties, the parties can also choose to opt for mediation through any formal written communication. It could even be an electronic communication between the parties uh, to mediate the conflict. And uh, that, that will be treated as a mediation agreement or mediation <clears throat> option between the parties. Uh, there is also the uh, pre-litigation mediation option, 
which is before instituting a suit, the parties may voluntary or by way of mutual consent, refer civil or commercial disputes for settlement. Now, requisite qualifications for a person to be appointed as a pre-litigation uh, mediator are also laid out in the Act of uh, 2023. There are, of course, certain exceptions given in the Act, uh, and the Act provides an indicative list of disputes which cannot be referred for mediation. Now, uh, namely, uh, criminal offenses, <clears throat> proceedings initiated in relation to misconduct of any registered professional, uh, such as a legal professional, medical practitioner, and so on, and disputes relating to levy and collection of any direct or indirect taxes or refunds. Uh, any proceeding in relation to subject matter uh, which falling uh, within any enactment over which the National Green Tribunal Act, which is uh, uh, for preservation of uh, environment, is applicable. These are some of the exceptions that cannot be mediated upon. Then <clears throat> the Act also, and this is a very, very welcome move, uh, especially uh, in the legislation, the Act actually contemplates a time limit uh, to complete the mediation proceedings. Now, um, uh, th this is extremely important because, you know, uh, we are known and our courts are known to be heavily loaded with a lot of pendency, and this, this will be a welcome step. We've also, uh, with the arbitration proceedings seen in India, that they sometimes last for years, even though it's supposed to be alternative mechanism, but that also sometimes lasts for uh, many, many months or many years. And therefore, setting a time limit to complete the mediation proceedings is extremely welcome uh, by uh, all the IP and, you know, general practitioners who would want to or, or parties who would want to actually adopt mediation as a mechanism for resolution of their disputes. Now, the mediation settlement agreements uh, may be registered on the conclusion of the mediation proceedings. However, registration of this agreement is made optional by the Act. Uh, and if the parties are not able to reach any conclusion or resolution of the conflict, then the mediator is supposed to submit a non-settlement report signed by the mediator, sent to both the parties, in which case the parties can then choose to sort of take a different course. The uh, uh, the, the most important fact here is the finality and enforcement of this agreement, you know, the, the, it is, the Act clearly states that the mediation agreements shall be final and binding upon the parties, and this is extremely important because it is not informal, and the parties are supposed to treat it as a binding agreement, as a binding uh, settlement agreement between the parties and uh, the people claiming under them. So uh, this is on equal footing with the judgment or decree of a court, and it is enforced in accordance with the Indian Civil Procedure Code of 1908. <clears throat> I'll move on to the next slide, okay. So uh, where, does, uh, where does it all stem from? And where, do, where does this whole thing get its feet from? There is a proviso um, in the Mediation Act of 2023. There is a proviso in Section 5.1 of the Mediation Act, which actually conspicuously stipulates that pre-litigation in matters of commercial disputes shall be in accordance with uh, uh, Section 12A of the Commercial Courts Act. And therefore, uh, the Mediation Act is to be read with the Commercial Court Acts very closely. The said acts expressly defines uh, what a pre-litigation mediation is, and it says that it is a process of undertaking mediation for settlement of disputes prior to institution of a claim before a court of law. So now the parties have to actually establish and demonstrate that they have made attempts, genuine bona fide attempts to settle their disputes before they institute a claim uh, in front uh, or, or submit a claim to a court of law. <clears throat> now, uh, this is important because, uh, you know, uh, many of the times the parties do not wish to sort of uh, talk to each other and, and, and a certain party or a plaintiff would straight away approach the courts of law for 
expediting uh, uh, and making a plea for ad interim injunctions, which is extremely uh, common in certain courts in India, especially for intellectual property disputes, because uh, they would claim that irreparable harm and injury is caused each day. Uh, you know, uh, their IP is being used in an unauthorized manner or is being infringed upon and so on. So it's important that, um, you know, now we have an exception for urgent relief. And it says that the uh, if, if there is an urgent relief that is sought, then that matter will not be actually uh, referred to mediation. Now, uh, it's very interesting that this urgent relief in itself can be in, interpreted in many ways. Uh, so whether or not a party is in need of urgent interim relief is subject to interpretation in itself. And in that regard, I'm bringing to four, uh, two important court judgments. The first one is Yamini Manohar. Uh, this is a Supreme Court judgment from October 2023, where the Indian Supreme Court, after analyzing um, you know, the, in the case said that um, uh, that uh, when a claim praying for urgent interim relief is instituted under Commercial Courts Act, the adjudicating court should examine holistically the nature, the subject matter of the claim of urgent relief, the cause and action and the prayers that are sought for. And uh, it gives also in the same uh, case, uh, the court, the Supreme Court also gave a forewarning that such urgent interim reliefs being sought uh, for, they must have legs to stand on and should not be baseless pleadings just to wriggle out of statutory mandate of uh, pre-litigation mediation as envisaged by the Commercial Courts Act. <clears throat> there is another judgment by the Delhi High Court, uh, which is Dr. Reddy's Lab uh, Limited versus uh, Smart Laboratory Private Limited. Uh, where it is discussed extensively by the court, the scope and impact of the Yamini Manohar case from the Supreme Court. And it is said that the court, uh, in this case, the court acknowledged the position that commercial courts cannot presume that every IP suit necessarily ipso facto requires urgent interim relief. However, it also pointed out in this case that, uh, you know, uh, if meaningful averments are being made, and then with respect to infringement, dishonesty, damage, loss, goodwill, repetition, etc., the court must defer to perception of the claimant and give uh, uh, urgent interim reliefs can be granted. So <clears throat> these are some important uh, decisions that are to be sort of kept in mind because now we'll see how the Mediation Act of 2023 will actually start uh, in unfolding itself, how parties will uh, take their disputes or conflicts to mediation and when they will approach um, uh, the courts for uh, any reliefs. Well, uh, then I've given some uh, general comments about why it's a welcome relief. Uh, it also recognizes online uh, mediation processes. Uh, it recognizes um, community mediations. It is time bound. We've already talked about it. It establishes actually a regulatory body, uh, the Mediation uh, Council of India, which will act, which will be responsible for these activities, which will be responsible for accrediting mediation service providers and so on. So these are some of the important and welcome moves we see. Uh, and well, if still parties are unable to resolve, we, we, we do all of us have the option of uh, going to a court of law. And uh, that's where uh, some of us will still land, which is not so bad for IP professionals and practitioners like us. And I, I'm hoping that uh, you all are still alive and still here with me listening to this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Lashika. Uh, thank you very much for that insight on the uh, developments in India for mediation. Uh, yeah, hopefully we are, yeah that we all don't we can settle and we don't have to go in the in the fist fights or pistol fights after that. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, all everyone with any questions for Lashika, please put in the Q and A section, and then we will uh, ask Lashika uh, pose those questions to Lashika at the end. Uh, now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask Juni to come on board and give a presentation on. Uh, on Singapore and mediation in general. 
Uh, Juni, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Lionel, uh, for that uh, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody, and especially to uh, LBS for uh, the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm so happy to see, you know, Lashika, thank you for, for that very quick introduction as well uh, to mediation. And, and I love the use of appropriate dispute resolution because I've also used it in the title of my presentation here. My name is Juni Lau, and Deputy CEO of the Singapore International Mediation Center. Um, I'll just do, go through this very quickly. I won't, of course, touch on litigation, arbitration, I think very, very well known. Uh, mediation, here we use it in the context of a facilitated negotiation with the help of a third party neutral called a mediator. Um, I, and I understand as well, you know, uh, mediation could mean and, could, and is practiced slightly differently in different jurisdictions. So um, very quickly, I think, uh, Angelica, if you can, uh, my colleague, uh, if you can, bring out the poll results. We, we just were curious to know how many uh, have actually mediated before. Uh, and oh, okay, so thank thanks a lot for displaying the results. We have 11% who have actually mediated as a party uh, and, and quite a few here, 30, 30 over percent have done uh, work as a mediator, uh, also the uh, equal number as counsel, acted as counsel. Some have also, uh, one person has done been a case administrator and some of course have had the opportunity to observe uh, mediation or help in uh, mediation and about 40% um, have uh, not been involved before. Uh, I think you're very fortunate to, to be able to observe a mediation because it's so private and so confidential that uh, sometimes, you know, we are kind of a, we're so, it's so private that people don't get an opportunity. It's not as visible as, say, court litigation. So thanks, thanks a lot for sharing the poll. Um, so we have about 60% uh, who've been involved in mediation in some way. Uh, just very quickly, uh, what does mediation look like as, as, as IMC? This is a picture of uh, one of our mediation rooms. Uh, as you can see, you know, softer furnishings is a bit friendly. Uh, Furniture is lighter in color as well. Uh, it's a circular arrangement. It's not meant to be sort of a confrontational, antagonistic, you know, facing off each other. Uh, mediator is at the head of the table, but then the parties, uh, these, of course, uh, they're real lawyers, real mediator. Parties are, are not real, of course, they're just acting. One hallmark of our um, mediations at SIMC, we always have case support. So uh, we have a colleague who is always present from the registry to assist uh, in the mediation in any way, for example, print help to print out the draft settlement agreements, sometimes with the refreshments and other logistics, little requests from the parties and their council and so on. Uh, so um, I won't go into, the, I won't play the video because there's no time, but if you're wondering uh, that sort of facilitative style of mediation that we, we generally tend to practice here, uh, please take a look uh, of, on this at this five minute video on our website uh, and it's very easy to find and uh, the URL is there. Um, it's facilitative, but I, I understand as well, uh, mediation in some jurisdictions is practiced quite evaluatively. It's just a matter of uh, culture, preference and style as well. Uh, and I understand in some industries, uh, they tend to prefer a more evaluative form of mediation. Um, but basically, uh, let, let me just summarize the approach here. Um, mediation, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, the, it's a lot more informal than, than formal court or arbitration proceedings. Uh, fewer rules as well, because uh, confidentiality is uh, prime, uh, have, has primacy in mediations. Uh, the decision maker, interestingly, is uh, there's not, not the mediator. It is the parties who decide on the outcome. So parties have a very, very big say. Uh, in the outcome of a mediation, there is there is no judge determining the outcome or arbitrator. The basis of interaction as well tends to be very collaborative versus uh, adversarial. It's, it's not an adversarial process at all. Even mediation counsel coming to a uh, mediation, uh, it, it is a shift in mindset. You don't come here all armed uh, to the gills to fight. Uh, you are here to advise, guide your client on the best possible options. What is, uh, you know, what is within the regulations? Uh, you know, what, what can they comply with? And of course, um, whether or not some of the offers on the table uh, should be accepted or not, or how can they be varied. Uh, the focus is, of course, is uh, less on past behavior and it's more about the future and what the parties interests are and the basis uh, of resolution is of course more based on interests uh, versus strict legal rights. Uh, this also means that sometimes the interests of, of parties that are not uh, third parties or external stakeholders can also be taken into account. So it's a very flexible process indeed. Um, mediation uh, is 
very effective in resolving disputes. Uh, we enjoy a settlement rate uh, at SIMC of over 70%. Of course, this means uh, huge cost savings and time savings for parties and mediations can be set up in uh, within one month, usually like within a week or two, uh, as long as everyone can agree on time, place, uh, mediator, and so on. And most mediations are one day long. It's quite hard to believe, um, but it's really, when you see the power of the process at work, it, it's really quite um, amazing how <laughs> the resolution can be achieved. Uh, and also mediation, uh, settlement agreements are actually enforceable. And of course, in, in the past, people would say, oh, but if it's cross-border, I have difficulty enforcing them. But these days, it is uh, uh, they are enforceable. We'll touch on that later. And of course, most importantly, parties control, uh, retain control over the outcome. I'll just very quickly introduce SIMC for those of you who are not familiar with um, what we do. We are a not-for-profit institution. Uh, we were launched in 2014, uh, pursuant to a working group set of working group recommendations on how to uh, position, how Singapore uh, can evolve and create an international uh, dispute resolution hub. Uh, be part of that international dispute resolution ecosystem. We already have arbitration at the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, and now we have an international cross-border mediation. We have an international panel of uh, 70 over mediators across 16 jurisdictions. We generally do case management, uh, training, promotion of mediation, and also thought leadership in this space. Um, let's just quickly go through. Um, the types of cases we see are literally almost everything and anything, including, of course, IP cases, uh, IT, metaverse, gaming. We've had some crypto that we are starting to see uh, as well. We're seeing ESG type cases, and uh, quite a bit of those involve licensing issues of, uh, over technology. So we, we say, you know, you can basically mediate anything and everything. Where do our parties come from? Uh, in the last uh, nine years that we've been around, we've seen cases filed of, uh, by parties from over 50 jurisdictions. So that's very exciting. Uh, we've uh, had some very interesting countries. Um, if you take a look at the, our case management over the last nine years, uh, we've had almost 370 cases. Actually, the number has exceeded since the start of this year. We've exceeded 370 cases now. Uh, total dispute value, 16 um, billion US dollars. Uh, so the, the value of the disputes tends to be quite large. Uh, and our top users, where do they come from? Uh, mainland China, India, and uh, the United States. These are our top uh, three overseas users. Um, I think in part, mediation has become quite popular because uh, also uh, due to the greater awareness generated by the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Now, this is the mediation equivalent of the New York Convention to Arbitration. Uh, it's a very young convention, but it um, you know, only was signed in 2019, uh, came into effect in 2020. Uh, but already on the first day of signing, there were there was a record 46 signatories. This is a record number for any uh, UN treaty or convention. So uh, this is quite a, a remarkable uh, convention. Right now, uh, 57 countries have signed. Uh, Japan acceded uh, to the convention uh, last year, and it will take effect on the 1st of April this year. 13 countries, uh, including Japan, have ratified, approved, or acceded to the convention. So increasingly, you will see uh, countries like the ones in red uh, recognizing um, settlement, international settlement agreements uh, and allowing the registration of these settlement agreements in the courts of those countries. So it's very exciting indeed. Every uh, So if you look at the, um, uh, the world's uh, top six economies, and five of them actually have already signed. Uh, Japan is the first to have ratified. It, it didn't sign on the first day, but what happened is uh, last early last year, they actually uh, enacted the legislation to support the registration of international settlement agreements in the Japanese courts, uh, and that takes, effects, um, takes effect uh, from 1st of April. So we are, of course, eagerly awaiting ratification by uh, US, China, and uh, India, of course, uh, and the UK. UK just signed the convention last year too. Uh, every year, there is a, a big event uh, called Singapore Convention Week in Singapore, and we it basically held to mark uh, the the coming into being of the Singapore Convention. Uh, at SIMC, we celebrated the event last year at Singapore Convention Week by holding in a, a 
signing of a declaration of intent to support mediation and we invited uh, companies, MNCs and uh, industry organizations to, to sign this declaration. Here's um, a look uh, at some of these companies and organizations uh, that signed from various jurisdictions. Uh, we also took the opportunity to sign several MOUs uh, and joint protocols, co-mediation protocols with various uh, ADR institutions. So these were from Japan. We renewed a co-mediation protocol, meaning it, uh, it's, a, it's an online mediation protocol involve, uh, involving uh, both institutions. So from Japan and Singapore, where we co we co uh, we nominate a co-mediator, one from each jurisdiction. And this is an entirely online mediation at, at special, very special rates that start from 5,000 US dollars per party. Uh, and we also have co-mediation with Turkey as well as Indonesia. We signed MOUs with Vietnam and India. Uh, the center photo is um, just on the 12th of January this year where we, made, uh, we created and we established a joint uh, maritime mediation panel with the Singapore Chamber of Arbitration. So uh, the SCMA, uh, that is our, literally our next door neighbor uh, and us have come up with a joint panel for maritime disputes as well. Um, very quickly, I know you all are interested to hear about case studies. Uh, so I'll have two uh, brief ones here. The first one involves an online learning App, okay, which uh, this this uh, case actually went to court. Uh, it involved a uh, the owner of the app, which is a Singapore company, uh, and a, a, a app developer and a subcontractor. So what happened is a subcontractor was contracted to run the project, and then the relationship soured. This meant that uh, service support for the app declined and uh, affected potentially thousands of users. So court proceedings were initiated, and then. Um, what happened was they subsequently agreed to bring the matter to, to mediation and attempt mediation. This was a one day um, mediation. And you know, in the course of the mediation, they, were, they realized that uh, they needed to put the interests of the affected users first. So, um, and they realized that court litigation would result in uh, you know, poor publicity for them as well. So they put aside the differences, they agreed to put the interests of the users first and in order to maintain good relations uh, and, their, and their reputation, they decided to, to settle. Uh, and they decided on the amount to be paid between them and uh, agreed to transfer the responsibility of the app from a subcontractor to another third party as well. So uh, this resulted in a outcome uh, that was really quick for them. This was a one day uh, litigate, uh, one day mediation uh, versus uh, court litigation, which would have taken a lot longer and potentially affected the uh, thousands of users that they had. So it was a commercially viable uh, solution for them. The second is a trademark dispute. Okay, so this involved a international lifestyle app and a Singapore so-called reseller, re reseller in inverted commas, because uh, actually what happened was um, uh, illegal copy, uh, copies of, um, so it became a trademark related dispute um, because the products had been pilfered from a factory overseas and then it, they resurfaced on a several e-commerce platforms resulting in millions of dollars of losses for the tech company. Uh, they sued the, uh, the so-called reseller, uh, and uh, as a result, they you know they went to court. Uh, the reseller eventually, of course, they they both uh, decided at some point to mediate instead, uh, and the reseller agreed to collaborate uh, with the company's investigators, uh, you know, on the upstream to see to help the investigators identify the perpetrators, uh, and in return, the company the reseller actually was able to. Um, make a lower payment in exchange, uh, which of course uh, helped a lot in this case. So the reseller wanted to stop the proceedings and of course pay less in damages and move on commercially. And this was accepted by the uh, tech company. So that again, this is something that a court uh, would ordinarily not be able to, to order, uh, but it of course helped resolve the the dispute and the lawsuit was discontinued. So, you know, the mediation focused on the underlying interests of the parties and of course solved the problem. So a um, couple of those couple of case studies, I'd like to, um, for IP specifically, uh, Singapore's intellectual property office actually has a scheme that to um, promote mediation and actually parties can receive 
uh, funding of up to 10,000 Singapore dollars uh, or up to 14,000 Singapore dollars if uh, foreign IP rights are involved as well. And this can be used towards covering 80% of your mediation related fees. Okay, so uh, the, the details are on the IPOS website if you'd like to um, take advantage of this grant scheme. Uh, the, uh, you know, you, basically the quid pro quo is that you agree to be named publicly, uh, but there'll be no sensitive, commercially sensitive uh, terms disclosed. Okay, so there are some interesting case studies as well from this. Uh, finally, I'd like to just uh, mention as well the importance of inserting a mediation clause uh, in your contracts, be only because uh, mediation is a consensual process. So if without a mediation clause, it's sometimes very hard to get the other side to uh, agree to come to mediation uh, in the heat of a dispute. So as um, we also see the trend of mediation being used in a very complementary way uh, in arbitration and litigation. It is a very flexible process and it can be done pre-dispute or during a dispute very quickly. We have uh, with the SIAC an ARPMED ARP protocol, which means that any uh, uh, case uh, can be filed for arbitration stayed for eight weeks at SIAC, comes to us for mediation. If it's settled, it goes back to be recorded as a consent arbitral award. There is a very similar process with the Singapore International Commercial Court as well, where parties can opt to file with the court and then stay it. It comes for mediation first and it goes back. If there's a settlement, it's a consent court order. Uh, finally, we have an interesting uh, development with uh, the Sinjin Court of International arbitration, which is a met up, meaning our mediated settlement agreements arising from mediations with us can be converted into consent arbitral awards in Sunchen. And we actually do have a number of partnerships with uh, various Chinese organizations and ADR institutions. Uh, Sunchen is here, but we also have one with the China Hangzhou uh, Intellectual Property and International Commercial Mediation Cloud Platform. So um, with that, actually, our next speaker is from CCPIT Hangzhou. Uh, he's Mr. Fu Beiti, and I will now hand over the floor to him. Please drop any questions you have for us in the Q&A box. We'll see you later. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fu Beiti from CCPIT Hangzhou. And to begin, I will provide you with a concise overview of Hangzhou. Hangzhou, the capital of Zhejiang province and the host of 2016 G20 summit and the 19th Asian Games, is recognized not only for its rich historical and cultural heritage, including three UNESCO World Heritage sites, but also for its, in its innovation and vitality, bolstered by flourishing private and digital economy. In recent years, Hangzhou has regarded improving intellectual property work as an important means to promote high quality economic development and business environment, and to enhance the level of IP creation, application, and protection. In 2022 Global Innovation Index ranking released by the World Intellectual Property Organization, Hangzhou advanced seven places from the previous year to rank 14th, and was successfully approved as a demonstration study for national intellectual property construction, Hondra actively promotes the resolution of IP disputes through commercial mediation. Against this background, established the Hangzhou, China Hangzhou Intellectual Property and International Commercial Mediation Cloud Platform. The platform is hosted by CCPIT Hangzhou Committee with professional guidance from Hangzhou Intermediate People's Court. It innovatively established a professional and intelligent problem solution model for online mediation of intellectual property and international commercial disputes, and provide the world with a Hangzhou solution for digital and non-litigation methods. The platform has in innovated a model for resolving online commercial disputes with Chinese characteristics within the internet era, making a positive contribution to the development of Hangzhou business environment and the construction of a diverse dispute resolution mechanism. Since its launch on June 30th, 2020, as of June 17th this year, the platform has received a total of 28,109 mediation cases, completed 23,452 
mediations and successfully mediated 8,696 cases, achieving a success rate of 37%. The amount involved in the cases is more than 44.9 billion yuan, RMB. The shortest time for the individual case mediation is just one day, and the fulfillment rate approaches 100%. And the cases accepted is from are from 36 countries and regions. The platform in innovative and smart online commercial mediation model has been successfully selected as the state council's best practice case of service trade innovative development. The platform has the following features. And firstly, with the help of data, artificial intelligence, and other technologies. The mediation cloud platform provides digitized functions such as online mediation, a unified online call center, loss connection recovery, electronic signature, and document generation. It has formed a one-stop online mediation process from online application to mediation completion, effectively improving the efficiency of dispute resolution. Secondly, platform has gathered professional diversified and international mediation forces from Hong Kong International Mediation Center, Singapore International Mediation Center, Zhejiang IP Protection Center, and so on. As for all, a total of 87 mediation institutions and more than 1,400 mediators have joined the platform to provide services to the public. And thirdly, the platform further improved the litigation method, coalition mechanism to form a dispute resolution model when mediation comes before litigation. The platform accepts cases both from independent application and referral by authorities. And fourthly, we CCPIT Hangzhou Committee, together with CCPIT Mediation Center, has established a national specification for online commercial mediation service group standard. The standard was officially implemented on June, January 1st this year and filled the standardization gap in the field of online mediation in China. The group standard is also contributing to the promotion and establishment of a legal business environment. Next, I will introduce one successful mediation case for you. In 2014, um, British copyright holders of Peppa Pig, the series characters, registered their rights in China. Despite the characters' high visibility on video platform, a jewelry company manu manufactured Peppa Pig jewelry without authorization, which was sold at a well-known department store in Hangzhou. In response, the plaintiffs initiated litigation against the unauthorized use. One mediator from the Hangzhou Mediation Center managed the mediation process through the cloud platform. After reviewing the case and similar legal precedents, the defendant agreed to mediation. Following thorough negotiations, a settlement was determined. To ensure this settlement will, would resolve all potential claims, defendant requested a legal endorsement of, uh, of agreement, which the mediator helped to secure, successfully resolving the dispute. And you may, after my introduction, you may ask how can foreign parties use the cloud platform? Foreign parties can access the platform and upload their cases by registering for an account using their passport number. After logging, they can upload case information Alternatively, foreign parties may appoint a domestic agent to handle the case on their behalf. The agent can register an account and switch to the agent identity when submitting case information. In the future, uh, we will continuously improve the specialized, digitized, and standardized service system and help to build a top-notch legal business environment. My introduction is over. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fu. Thank you very much uh, for that informative uh, disposition on uh, China and the, the cloud platform. Okay, uh, now we are in the session of the Q&A for the panelists. I think we have uh, we do have quite a few uh, questions that have been posed. Uh, let me um, 
I think some have been answered, but let me read out um, uh, them and maybe the panelists can also uh, supplement. Uh. Okay, uh, Lashika, um, the first uh, issue is uh, there's some mention of international mediation in the in the new um, Indian Mediation Act. And the question is, does it go far enough to enable India to ratify the Singapore Convention? Uh? Right? And I think uh, your answer is that yes, among the first to sign. Uh, right? The so I, I suppose that means that it there is there is room for that. And, and you'd like to elaborate on that? Yes, that's right. Okay. I, I don't know if there's any other further query on this, but I can I'm happy to answer that. Okay. Well, I think the next question also for you is uh, you mentioned there's a time limit to complete mediation, right? Under the Mediation Act, it says there's a time limit. So I think that's 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 the uh, question. What is the usual time limit? Um Maybe 120 you're... days. 120. I've given the answer. 120 days from when the mediation starts. It can be extended, <clears throat> but there's a limit of 60 days on extension. So I've posted that detailed uh, hmm. answer. Okay. When you said 60 days, is that one time? You can only one. yes edit one more yes for 60 days. yes. Let's see. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that that means that uh, it's quite expeditious. Uh. you must uh, settle the mediation in fairly, fairly reasonable time. Okay. Um, next question, again to Lashka. What do you see happening in courts when a dispute that concerns a right in REM is decided by mediation? Uh, again, I've answered this one. We've seen that uh, uh, when it is a right in REM for arbitration, the courts have not upheld it because they say that such disputes cannot be arbitrated upon. I also touched upon some of those landmark judgments in my presentation. For mediation, because it's a new act, it's just come into action a couple of months back. We don't know with respect to that. But for arbitration, we have the distinction of in rem and in personam. Okay, so I think this will be a developing area uh, in returns in respect of mediation. Um, next one, as part of case management in court proceedings, are the courts actively promoting mediation or do they require lawyers to advise their clients on the suitability? Uh, so courts I think are directing, uh, yes, uh, courts are directing the litigants to first go and uh, mediate. They're actually, even before the act came into action, the courts were already directing uh, the litigants, especially in IP dispute matters, to go and mediate and then if nothing works, then come back to the court of law or come back with a settlement agreement. Right, right. Okay. Um, next one is a question for Lashika. Is it right that the Indian Mediation Act has not yet been fully notified? Uh, if not, then how long? So you say it's notified already in the Gazette? Yes, on 15 yes. <clears throat> the so, minute any act is published in the Gazette of India, it is deemed to be notified. It was published on 15th of September. Uh, mm. in the gazette, so it is uh, notified. Right, right. Okay, so that means yeah, it's, it's, that's, that means it's, it's effectively in, in force as of fifteen September twenty twenty three. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, question. I think this is for Juni. Uh, Juni, is there a model dispute resolution clause that you can share? We wish to opt for the SIMC SCIA met up protocol. Yes, I popped the answer into the into the Q and A box as well. It's under the answer tab. Uh, yes, I put the page we have on our website a one full page full of uh, model clauses, so you are able to pick and choose uh, which ones would most suit you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and next question for Juni. I think this one: uh, How effective is mediation? I think uh, do you have a uh, real results questions for SIMC? Yes, very happy to take this one. Uh, absolutely. Mediation, as I've mentioned, is uh, highly effective. Our settlement rate is 72% uh, currently. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so you, there's nothing to lose really by attempting mediation. And very often, mediation can be arranged so quickly. Uh, we, we've done mediation, we've arranged mediations in a matter of days. Uh, we don't, of course, 
advisory <laughs> people to rush. And I, I think your council and, and the parties also would appreciate a bit more time. But we uh, the registry is very efficient. So we've had cases that come in uh, on a Friday and they're they've gone into mediation on a Thursday, the following week. So that's that's how fast the mediation can be mounted. Uh, generally, the timelines for court litigation and for arbitration are fairly generous. So it is possible while, you know, um, adhering to these timelines for arbitration or litigation to actually attempt mediation, there's really nothing much to lose. Most mediations, 90% of our mediations actually are one day long. And even, uh, we always say, uh, even if you don't settle, uh, there could be partial settlements. So you have five issues, maybe you resolve three, and then you take two to arbitration or litigation. That's, that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility, of course, is... Uh, uh, you, even if they haven't um, crystallized, uh, if um, you've not settled, but there's been an opportunity to crystallize issues uh, under the guidance of a mediator. So that's another um, you know, benefit of the process as well, that the mediator has spent a day with the parties going back and forth, of course, under confidentiality to discuss the interests and help you know, uh, look at their positions and help parties sort of examine where they can perhaps consider give and take. So even if the mediation is, is not successful on the first try, sometimes also what we see is that uh, uh, they may want to come back again uh, for a second round, uh, maybe after thinking it through. So uh, there can be these different ways of, um, cons you know, of, of uh, sometimes it's part of legal strategy as well. Sometimes we also agree that may timing may not be right too early in a in a dispute. Sometimes parties need to take time as well to, uh, you know, look. To, the case needs to develop and gestate, and then look at the, the pleadings, and then then they decide. Okay, maybe we should take that step uh, to mediate or, or not. Uh, our most successful uh, mediation, uh, our biggest, largest dispute really that was successfully mediated was um, a one billion US dollar matter. This was a licensing of uh, uh, fuel cell technology uh, between US and Korean parties, and and actually quite an interesting one because uh, it has been actually reported in uh, Global Arbitration Review. So uh, I'll pop the. Um, the, we've got a, a note written up. Um, we've had some events around it where it's one of those rare cases that was actually uh, parties were named because uh, there, were, there were parties that had to also make uh, uh, SEC filings as well. Mm -hmm. So everything was public, including the settlement agreement. So you can actually look uh, more into that case uh, if you're interested. Uh, it was uh, actually a, a dispute that lasted seven years. So mm -hmm. <laughs> seven years um, five arbitrations in Singapore, so London, two court litigations in the US, took seven years of fighting. And then finally, uh, the, the matter came uh, to SIMC. The Korean mediator actually uh, you know, suggested mediation and then the uh, US party agreed to come to mediation. So, so that was successfully resolved. The, the mediation was set for four days in, in Seoul. Mediator flew there during the COVID pandemic uh, and they came to an in-principle agreement in three and a half days and it took another two months uh, to draft the settlement agreement and sign it. So I think given that it took seven years <laughs> for this dispute, you know, and it went on for a long time, I think the fact that it was mediated in three and a half days was, was a good outcome. Well, that's very positive for the parties, huh? having a dispute over seven years being resolved in a 40s mediation. Okay, that's a very good uh, case example. I uh, urge all uh, participants, uh, please uh, have a read about that case. Okay, uh, next um, uh, question for Mr. Fu. Uh, what strategies are effective uh, for uh, companies involved in cross-border intellectual disputes uh, to engage in successful mediation in China? Maybe perhaps you could give some tips for companies to be aware of. Thank you for your question. Um, I think first select an experienced and reputable international or domestic mediation organizations that fit the need of the company. And secondly, hire a team of legal professionals and specializing in domestic and international intellectual property laws to serve as legal advisors. They can provide expert opinions during the mediation process and help formulate negotiation strategies. Thirdly, negotiate flexibly based on the fact and extent of infringement. Propose a reasonable compensation plan or business cooperation model, such as licensing agreements. Maintain an open attitude during the mediation to find a solution acceptable to both parties while firmly protecting your legal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, fourthly, after mediation concludes, companies should continue to monitor market dynamics to prevent the resurgence of infringing activities. 
strengthening management and the protect uh, of protection of their intellectual property. So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fu. That's very good. Uh, four, good four points to keep in mind, uh, especially if uh, disputes in, in in China and then you go for mediation. Thank you. Uh, next question for I think Juni. Uh, at which point does one opt for mediation? Uh, how is this less painful as compared to just taking up to court? And what is the time frame difference between the two? Uh, maybe Juni, I think, yeah, you've. Uh... I, did, I did address some of that, uh, yeah, in, in my answer. Uh, it, it's really sometimes a, a matter of legal strategy. Uh, some, sometimes parties uh, also do not want to be the first to, to propose mediation because they, they kind of feel that they, have, you know, they show that they the other side may think that they, it's a sign of weakness. However, we, we often recommend that you reframe it uh, to show that you are genuine and you really wish to try and preserve the relationship, uh, that you are willing to, uh, to, to consider mediation and attempt it. Uh, what sometimes we've, we've heard as well parties do is they prepare the notice of arbitration and they actually tell the other side, said, look, we, we value our relation, a working relationship, we want to try and settle. But if we do not settle, we are ready to file the notice of arbitration. So that way they, they, want, they can show that they are very serious about proceeding if it doesn't settle. So that's, again, some strategy you might want to consider. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, it's a lot less painful than, than going all the way, the whole hog into trial and all the prep and the getting up. Uh, it, is, it is very uh, time consuming and very uh, stressful as well. And I think parties also need to consider whether they want to take the stand, because sometimes mm. uh, disadvantages evidence will, will come up and you know it can be potentially very embarrassing. One of the cases that we had last year, it was, uh, I think it was, so, it was again, uh, uh, so, uh, some fuel cell technology, a different case altogether, um, in different companies, uh, in different countries as well. They, I think once the pleadings and everything came out, then they realized, and one party realized that uh, they and they had just completed another separate arbitration unrelated to the matter. And they said, no, we don't want to go through the whole, uh, take the stand again. So they 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 proposed mediation and it, it was in the middle of an arbitration. So there was no up man up clause at all. Uh, mm -hmm. One side proposed, the other side uh, took a while to think about it. They agreed, it went for mediation and it was successfully um, you know, concluded so and, and settled. Okay. Maybe Lashika, I'm going to add into this, maybe from the India perspective, you know, how how receptive are, I suppose, companies in India for mediation, um, you know, culturally and maybe uh, legally? Uh, are, they, are they open to mediation and, and do they see the benefits of it? Yes, absolutely. I, I think culturally, uh, I already gave examples how, uh, you know, as a society and over the ages, we've always had the, uh, you know, culture of discussing things coming to resolve conflicts through discussions and negotiations and this act is still new it's only been a couple of months that uh, it's been uh, you know in action but even before that uh, uh, companies and organizations would always have some kind of informal um, not an institutionalized mediation but surely a mechanism to mediate disputes by appointing a mediator or a panel of mediators uh, of uh, the choice of the parties to discuss before they even approach arbitration. So <clears throat> I think the first approach has always been, uh, uh, you know, to mediate disputes, appoint senior professionals, experts in the domain to mediate. And then uh, even before arbitration, if, if that fails, then approach uh, the arbitrator and appoint an arbitration panel or an arbitrator for uh, managing the dispute. So uh, I, I, this will be a very welcome change and this is a very welcome act because now all of this has been formalized and we have enforceability. Now the mediation agreement is binding. So uh, it has sort of formalized what companies have been doing for many years now. Okay, great. We look forward to, uh, we look forward to more of such uh, successful cases and hopefully like, like Juni's uh, case you mentioned, it was publicized as well so that everyone can get, uh, you know, um, a feel of the success for mediation. Maybe I'll move on to a question to Mr. Fu. Um, Mr. Fu, can you give examples of a successful IP mediation case in China? And uh, maybe what key factors contributed to their resolution? And uh, in a copyright infringement case of uh, Peppa Pig brought by certain companies from the UK against a certain gold jewelry companies and the renowned department store in Hangzhou, 
the mm -hmm. cloud platform utilizes an innovative online mediation model to dissolve this dispute proactively by leveraging mm -hmm. its online mediation capabilities across the regions in cooperation with judicial power. It promptly initiated the mediation process, guide, guiding the parties to reach an agreement, which was then confirmed through judicial means. This effectively and effectively reduce the litigation cost and efficiently resolve the conflict. And the pro professionalism and the impartiality of the specialized mediation organization and mediators were crucial in conducting an in-depth analysis of the case. And they thoroughly set core issues such as litigation risks and the compensation amounts and facilitate facilitated consensus between the parties on a mutual beneficial Basis, avoiding further loss. By using modern information technologies, the platform enables online dispute resolution, enhancing mediation efficiency, reducing geographic constraints, and increasing the transparency and the fairness of the mediation process. This contributed to the parties resolving their disputes quickly and conveniently. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you for that uh, elucidation. Um, you know, next question, quite interesting one. I think it's posed to all speakers, but uh, maybe maybe I'll ask Juni first to answer for Singapore perspective. Okay, what happens, usually happens if one party breaches the mediation settlement agreement? Do they once again have to choose mediator or other forms of dispute resolution? That's a good question, right? You have a mediation agreement, but, but somehow it's not, uh, it's, it's in breach, right? So do we go and mediate again uh, to, to try to settle this breach? <laughs> what yeah, happens if you need... the question on enforceability, of course. Uh, this, of course, there you would usually have, a lot of countries would have a domestic law in place to allow for re uh, registration of the, the settlement agreement. Uh, but of course, just now I was referring to the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which refers to international mediated settlement agreements. And what happens then is uh, because you have parties in different countries. So uh, which you know, law takes precedence, uh, what do you do, and so on. So this is what the, the, the Singapore Convention does. It actually provides for, number one, recognition of internationally mediated settlement agreements cross -border, in cross-border disputes. Uh, number two, it also provides for an enforcement mechan uh, mechanism. So where you wish to enforce that settlement agreement, you can then register it in that country if it is a, a party to the Singapore Convention and of course if, if it's a, the convention has taken effect. So what happens is uh, I mentioned just now there were like 50, almost 60 now signatories to the Singapore uh, Convention and uh, but not everyone has ratified. So usually what happens between uh, signing the convention and ratification is that it gives the uh, countries' time to enact the legislation required to recognize these international mediated settlement agreements. And then um, after these, uh, this legislation comes into effect, then uh, you can register it in the courts of that country for enforcement purposes. This means that then the settlement agreement has the weight of a court order and it can be um, enforced. So I think Lionel and <laughs> Lashika, do you want to jump in on yeah, maybe uh, Lashika, before I before I, I I get your views, my my I just give my comments. Uh, I think the question is asking, sh let's say, uh, should there be even a mediation clause inside the settlement agreement? Let me give the settlement agreement that says if there's a dispute arising from this settlement agreement, should we go for mediation? <laughs> wow. I think that's the gist of that question. Uh. Maybe uh, Lashika, yeah. you, have to, you have to weigh in on that. Right. I, I, the way you put it, Lionel, is very interesting, and that becomes even more complicated. No, but yeah. then if, if we were to do that, I think it would be very cyclic, but at least yeah. uh, from the Mediation Act that we see in India, the agreement will be binding and it can be registered. Uh, it, you know, it is a binding agreement. It's as good as a contract. Uh, the Civil Procedure Code in India is applicable on it. The Contracts Act will be applicable. So it's, it's pretty much the same as if you were to breach a term of the contract. Uh, and uh, I mean, we are yet to see how and what happens if that happens. Uh, but I, I really don't know if if they say that if there's a dispute from that agreement goes to mediation, then it'll uh, probably be psychic. But I guess then we go back to the intention of the parties. And that's also something that I mentioned during my presentation, that when courts are granting an ad interim injunction for an urgent relief, which is an exception where, uh, uh, you know, created in the act, 
uh, uh, all uh, weigh heavily on the intention of the parties. It is just uh, mentioned as a prayer in the petition that uh, urgent injunction should be granted, or is it actually causing harm, irreparable harm, injury, and so on? So I think it all goes back to uh, sort of that point. And uh, ultimately, if if this is being used as just a mere tactics to sort of extend the discussions or come to a settlement, uh, I'm sure, you know, we, we all know how that happens. And we, we know how one needs to sort of mitigate that. But of course, the courts having jurisdiction over the matter can jump in, the parties can approach the courts and take the matter to court, just like any other breach or, uh, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think, okay, we are, we are told that we have got to wrap up soon. One last question, maybe one last question I have here. Um, Juni first, uh, maybe from your experience, what has been the most effective way to convince parties to engage in mediation or to include a mediation clause in their contracts? Mm, okay, uh, to we always say, please put the clause in. Okay, that gives you the option then uh, to, to mediate. Uh, at least there's a window there built into your contract uh, to, to mediate and you know, you, people don't question that. Uh, it gets really tough if, if in the middle of a dispute, suddenly you say, hey, I want to mediate. <laughs> then the other side can just say, no, I don't want to, and walk away. Uh, then you're a bit stuck. <laughs> so, uh, so best practice, please, you know, I've got, I've put the, pop the link for the mediation clauses uh, in the answer box. So please uh, take a look at the clauses. And of course, you're welcome to, to look at others as well online. Uh, think very carefully how you want to structure your, uh, your mediation clause. Sometimes it could be tiered, you know, so you say, uh, we'll have ne negotiation first, or we'll refer it to the, you know, MD, or we'll escalate it to the CEO, failing which then we will attempt mediation. Uh, then if it doesn't settle, we'll go to arbitration or litigation. That's kind of like the tiered clause. Um, and usually, like I, I, the courts in Singapore, at least, are, are very, um, uh, they're, they're very supportive of of such uh, mediation clauses. Yeah, I think I think when parties are in still in good, um, um, you know, they they there's good will. Everyone wants to 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 enter the agreement. Everyone wants wants to close. There's a time when you introduce the mediation clause to say, well. We never know, right? In future, something happens, but let's let's mediate to let's let's put in a formal mediation process so that at least there's a chance for for you know if, if we we avoid acrimony and and go for the mediation route. Yeah. So I think increasingly companies are well aware of of of, of this uh, the benefits uh, of of mediation. Okay, um, I think are we are we up for time? Do we? I think we have to do a wrap up now. Okay, maybe do a wrap up. Um, I think for all uh, pen, uh, for all the attendees, if you have any more questions, please do send it in to us, right? Uh, we will then direct to the various panelists and, you know, if possible, they can uh, reply to you in, in by, by email as well, reply to your specific queries. Uh, okay. Um, yes, uh, with that, maybe a, a, a quick wrap-up. Uh, maybe Lashika will just uh, uh, say a final few words uh, on... on, on or mediation. So, uh, yes, I, I would say the act uh, per se is still new in the country. So we are yet to see how we fare over it. But I think it's a very welcome move for various reasons that have earlier been mentioned. And uh, 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 the intention is to do business and business and more business. And I think this aids that fully and it's keeping in that spirit. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we, we I mean, with the media, mediation acts in force, I think uh, it will... Uh, accelerate this process of uh, of of parties uh, approaching mediation in India, and uh, for those parties that are uh, or companies that are involved in commercial contracts in India, I think this is a good time uh, to to in ensure that the clauses are in there, uh, mediation clauses are in there, right? Uh, Juni, maybe some words. Uh, yeah, actually there was there was a question um that just okay. came in actually about uh, Singaporean company <laughs> dealing with uh, Chinese vendors. Uh, oh, yeah. would you recommend the S uh, SIMC SEIA? Uh, model. Mm. So this this actually just to give you some background. This model actually came about as a result of a G two G meeting uh, between Singapore and and Shenzhen. So uh, it's under the Smart City Initiative, and and therefore uh, it is it's really got a lot of uh, a will behind it, and you know interest as well. Uh, it is of course uh, something that uh, would encourage parties to use and you know attempt the. To, to use this model, make good use of it. Uh, it already exists. So, you know, mediate with us. And then after that, 
uh, your settlement agreement can be taken and registered with Sunshine Court of International Arbitration and, and converted into a consent arbitral award. And then if there are any considerations, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, of course, every case is different. So uh, you may want to, of course, come and consult us and, and in Sunshine and we can all have a call and a discussion over, you know, the unique uh, you know, facts of your case. Uh, so, of course, you wouldn't know currently what what the your matter is about so please please get in touch with us and we'll be very happy to to connect you as well and, and mm. take your questions yeah um of course please you know think about um mediation i said mentioned the clauses just now uh the other thing is of course sometimes parties would say okay it's built into uh your contract and then of course if both sides then agree we don't want to mediate that's fine you know you can uh you can then say we've talked about it and then we filed for mediation but we choose maybe not to proceed um, but however it's in your contract at least if both sides agree then that's fine it's party autonomy and you know you, you go with it um, but at least make you know make that provision uh, available in your your contract so that you don't have to later try and um, uh, really beg get a site to to to, to uh, try mediation and of course you know our courts are, are very supportive generally and it's a lot uh, faster to, to resolve it amicably especially for commercial disputes of course we always say aid, uh, appropriate dispute resolution so of course if there's a question of law that needs a judicial determination then please by all means uh, file it in court okay uh, thank you very much i do to wrap up i think uh uh, just note that we will be sharing the uh the slide decks of of the webinar uh, after this webinar uh and then the details of all the individual speakers on panelists will be up as well um i think they will be shared in the chat chat box uh. i think if you go into your chat box you should be able to see all the 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 contact details of all the panelists so uh please feel free to 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 write to them if you have any burning questions um, and you know um, and get involved or you know if you you need to uh, find a suitable mediation center or you have you, you have right now in the process of a dispute and you want to uh, offer mediation to the other party then you know please get in touch and we I think they will be able to assist um like to just finally thank everyone all everyone attending um uh, on my part I would just say uh, if you are not yet a member of LES as <laughs> executive society, I uh, hope that you know such uh, webinars that we present are informative. And if you want to be participating in such future seminars, please do uh, sign up in your local chapter, right? And then you you can be part of the LESI community. And then there are many many webinars of uh, you know short and uh, very useful webinars that are, are put together by various societies. And you know uh, and 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 you know, will assist you in your your professional work. Okay, now with. The and a quick yes. thank you as well to our, our team in the background, uh, Fern, Angelica, and Magna, for helping us as well produce this uh, event. Yes, uh, thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fu, coming, uh, joining us from, from China. Uh, Lashika from LES thank India, you. thank you very much. And of course, uh, Juni for SIMC and all the people in the background uh, making this such a, a, a great event, very interactive. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions that's been posed, but again, uh, the, the chat, function will have all the, the details and uh, you have all our contact details uh, for attendees please uh, do write into us uh. okay bye okay. everybody thank you very thank much you. bye great day. thanks for coming thank you <laughs> thanks Lionel thank you bye bye